Today's session, Navigating Your Career in a Virtual World, Making a Persuasive and Effective Rockstar Pitch. I would like to mention that we will send this out in communications as we are recording it. And once the recording is available, it will go out to you. Today's slides will also be shared in our post-event email, so be on the lookout for that. And we also will have some event photography taking place today. So if you are not comfortable being photographed, please feel free to turn your cameras off. Today's session is session two of our six part series. You can see the sessions here. And again, at the bottom, we have the active link that will be shared with you. So we encourage you to register for all of our remaining sessions. It's really built, this session is built for whether you're working from home, possibly looking for new career opportunities, maybe you're seeking to transition in your career, or maybe you just wanna refresh your skills and reinvent yourself. But today is for you and this session is really for you. And so we've designed it for that purpose. I do wanna take a moment and introduce today's speaker, as well as our Q&A moderator. Alumnus Conrad Ribeiro is entering his 11th year at Google, where he is the sales excellence lead, developing and delivering sales, coaching programs for the retail sector. He was formerly the head of industry for media and entertainment, where he partnered with motion pictures, studios, TV networks, as well as home entertainment clients, such as Universal Pictures, NBC Entertainment, and Focus Features. Together, they pushed the edge of how digital marketing, media, and data were used to find and delight entertainment consumers. Prior to Google, Conrad had marketing roles in global brand management at Activision as well as Disney. Conrad also serves as an adjunct faculty at USC, Go Waves, and is teaching digital marketing at Marshall. <laughs> Today's Q&A moderator, Professor Linda Palmer, has over 25 years of strategic marketing experience in varying industries, including automotive, financial services, and healthcare. She currently serves as the strategic advisor for Lear Marketing and Communications, a boutique marketing agency serving primarily automotive and healthcare related clients. She has ex expertise in developing impactful, integrated and marketing communication, developing and delivering customized corporate training programs, face-to-face -face and online, as well as powerful keynote presentations. Linda has been a member of the Pepperdine University faculty since 1993, teaching graduate marketing and digital marketing communications. She was awarded the Aspire Teaching Award in 2019. She's also involved in Pepperdine's executive education and has developed and delivered customized programs to a number of companies, including Transamerica, Genoa Healthcare, Fox Entertainment, and Dignity Health. In addition to teaching and consulting, Linda is also, she's busy, busy. She's also the director of Pepperdine's Education to Business Program and is currently researching and publishing on industry collaborative learning. Wow, do we have an amazing set of folks presenting to you today. Now, let me turn it over to Conrad for him to kick off his presentation. Thank you. Nicole, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that great intro. Um, I know I'm listening to it and I'm like, wow, Linda sounds really impressive. She should be leading, but I'll see if I can match her, uh, her expertise and energy. Um, it's so great to see everybody. And uh, thank you for giving us an hour of your time. I hope to make it worth it. Uh, I look down the list of names and I do see some familiar faces. Uh, so it's great. Thank you for joining. And for those who I haven't met, uh, my name is Conrad Ribeiro. Um, I've got a little presentation for you. I will throw it up here. The slides are just used to sort of guide the conversation. So just to set some expectations for you, feel free. Uh, we, are, we will definitely have Q&A. Lynn and I are going to have a chat on the back end. Um, we will have time for Q&A and, and it's built in. But along the way, if there are things you'd like to discuss, you are absolutely welcome to put that in the chat. Um, if there's a way to get to it in flow during the conversation, you bet we're, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, um, we, will, we will get your Q&A on the back end. So um, with that, I will dive in. Um, like I said, my name is Conrad Ribeiro. Um, I've been at Google now for a little over 10 years, going into my 11th year at Google. Before that, brand management, Activision, video games, uh, Walt Disney 
Studios Home Entertainment. Um, before that, some consulting, and before that, my my MBA. So I wanted to. I was invited in to give you a sense of how I'm thinking about career, and um, and some things I've learned along the way that might be helpful. Um, so with that, let's just get right to it. Uh, I figured there's three things I want to cover. It's super technical, so you'll want to take notes. There's practical stuff. There's impractical stuff, and there's important stuff. Again, I know this is super technical, uh, so if I lost some of you there, I'm so sorry. Um, but I think uh, it would be kind of, uh, I'd be kind of ripping you off if I didn't give you some practical stuff, but I wanna challenge you to think about things that aren't like right in the wheelhouse of, uh, of practical. And then I want you to think about things that I found are important. Um, sometimes we get super wound up in practical, and we leave important. And I think if I've learned anything over the last 365 days, it's to scope out and figure out what's important and what isn't. So uh, in the context of career, I hope to, to land that for you. Um, all right. So again, it would be a total way. To, you, I'd be ripping you off if I didn't give you some practical stuff. So here's what I have sort of pulled out of uh, about 20 years since leaving the beautiful shores of the full-time program up in Malibu. Um, all right, getting into it. So practical stuff, I'm gonna give you a few things. The deck's going out, so don't feel like you have to write all this stuff down. Uh, I think the recording is as well. But uh, if you like, care to take notes, um, here's, here's where I think you can nail it in an interview. When you get in there in an interview and with anybody at a company you want to work for, an industry you want to work for, a role you might want. I think if you can demonstrate these five things, these five characteristics, people are going to say like, yeah, I'm in. That person seems like somebody that, that would work on my team, somebody who, that would work for my company. Here's the first one. Um, problem solver. At the end of the day, I really feel like people are, I'm, when I hire, and I've done a fair bit of uh, both hiring at Google, I've hired, you know, more than a half dozen, less than a dozen people in my time at Google, and I've interviewed well over a hundred. We're hiring you to come in and solve a problem. So if you can demonstrate you are a problem solver, and more specifically that you have a process for how you think about solving very complex problems and where there's pretty much ambiguous information and you're not, it's not laid out for you, those are the people I wanna hire. Because all of the really tactical problems, all the really rote stuff that's just like, just grinding, that's all going to be automated. Machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence is taking all of that off the table. So what we need are people who can think strategically about solving complex problems, because at least at my company, those are the only kind of problems our clients really ask us to solve. So be a problem solver. Uh, the second thing is, and I, you know, this is one of those ones is like, yeah, well, of course, leadership. Um, where I really think people excel is when they go beyond, I was a leader by title, therefore I'm a leader. And they're able to show me emergent leadership where their leadership showed up in situations where they didn't have a title, where they weren't actually the leader, where there was a problem to be solved and they stepped in, they rallied resources, they worked cross-functionally, they got people into kind of into line and drove some consensus and got the problem solved when it wasn't really their job to do so. So I'm always looking for emergent leadership rather than just, I'm a leader, I have this many people under me, and therefore I'm a leader. I, I don't know. I want to know how that showed up in real life. All right. The third thing is work ethic. I mean, this one's hard to show, but if you can demonstrate that you have, when, when you need to turn it on, you can really go into go mode. I love it when people are able to demonstrably show that they have a massive work ethic. And we see that a lot. I see that a lot in my colleagues. Um, I mean, we're, I think we're in a privileged possession at, at Google where we get a lot of resumes and we're able to, to hire really good people. But boy, over and over again, I'm working with people who work so hard and they're able to show work ethic. Um, the fourth thing, what are you bringing that we don't already have? Um, we, you know, uh, we thank God walked away from culture fit a few years ago. Um, culture fit <laughs> driving a certain homogeneity uh, that I don't think benefited anybody. 
uh, well, it benefited some people, but it didn't benefit the quality of work we were doing and it didn't uh, benefit the strength of the teams we were building. So we left culture fit and we started to think about culture ad. What are you bringing that adds to the alchemy that we already have? What are, what's the sprinkle of magic that you bring? I like to think my team is a diamond. But if you can bring a facet that we don't have, I think we shine a little brighter. So can you communicate that thing that you bring authentically and that's demonstrably true that is going to add to our team? And this is the last one. It's just like smarts. I want to know, like, can you show me that you're thinking in a way I don't already think? You're strategic. You're bringing in points of view. You're coalescing information into a higher order of thinking. Um, if you can get that, and by the way, I put it fifth for a reason. If somebody is a hard worker who pro solves problems and is a leader and brings something special, like not everybody has to be Mensa level smart. In fact, what I'm looking for is strategic smarts and that ability to integrate information. So what don't you see on here? Role related knowledge. I'm assuming that if you got the interview, they think you have the role related knowledge, the ability to do the job. So to me, that is the resume got you in, you got through a screener interview, you've demonstrated, I think you can either do the job or be trained to do the job. How you separate and what a rock star pitch is, is how you separate. If you can demonstrate these five things, I think you separate. And we're gonna talk about that notion of differentiation in a moment. So those five things. All right, now when you get into the interview, um, this one may be kind of obvious, but I want to restate it because I know I wasn't prepping for interviews correctly. And when somebody nails th these two little hints, you can really show because it shines. So you've got your five things. There's two kinds of examples I want you to come into the interview with. And one is behavioral. This is backwards looking. So you got your five characteristics. You're like, yeah, I'm great leader and I'm super hard worker and a problem solver and I'm going to add something special and uh, uh, I've got smarts. I want to see behavioral examples, backwards looking examples that demonstrate, that make it demonstrably true that those five things are part of who you are. So have your behavioral examples and that's easy. You just sit there and you think and you get them down, you have them in your pocket, two or three for each. Awesome. Um, the one where I don't think people, and I know I didn't put as much time into prepping uh, was this one which is hypothetical examples. So if behavioral are, tell me about a time when you had to step in and solve a problem that needed to be solved. Like, okay, great, you have your example. Hypothetical is where I really start to see how you think because it's, what would you do if? Hey, you're on a team where there is conflict between you know, your two leads. How do you manage through that conflict? It's not telling me about a time you did it. It's telling me how you'd handle it. This is where that notion of having a process for breaking down a problem or thinking about a solution, it becomes really important. I can tell when somebody's throwing a dart at a board and kind of like, well, if I throw enough spaghetti at this wall, something's gonna stick. And I see the interview start to get super chatty. And it's like, that's not a concise answer. You don't have a point of view. If you have a process for breaking down a hypothetical and like, okay, great. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I'm gonna get some information. I'm gonna define the problem. I'm gonna think about some solutions that would work. If you have that problem and can lay that out for me, I mean, spoiler alert, half of the questions we ask in interviews don't have answers. The point is not to get the answer. The point is to see how you think. So if we're asking you a hypothetical, it's not because I know how that problem should be solved. It's because I wanna know how you would go about solving it. So behavioral examples, hypothetical examples. If you have both of those in your pocket coming into an interview and you have those five characteristics that are demonstrably true, I already think you can probably do the job or I wouldn't be talking to you. So come in and crush those five things, looking back and looking forward. And I think you're going to have a really good chance at uh, differentiating. And we'll get to that in a moment. Here's another piece of practical advice. Man, this is an interview. It's also a conversation. Um, oh man, the delta between an average to good candidate and a great candidate is often when they ask me a question that sits me back in my seat and has me going, that's a good question. Um, when somebody comes in with a question that demonstrates that they went a little bit deeper than just doing a basic Google search on Google, which is meta in its own way, 
if you come in prepared with questions that demonstrate you're thinking not just about the facts of my business, but about the challenges we're facing. Hey, I know I'm interviewing for you, but tell me how you're thinking about this problem within the industry. Tell me about how you're orienting your organization, your resources, your products to solving this consumer challenge. Wow, that was a good question. When I see somebody who's thinking at that level, it's less about them telling me how great they are and more about how great they think. And the difference between the two is all the difference between a truly standout candidate and somebody who's just good. Um, come in with great questions. And when they're like, we're gonna say five minutes at the end for you to have questions, use that time, have a point of view. There's nothing crisper in an interview than somebody who comes in with a point of view about the challenges my business faces and how they think they would solve it. Cause sometimes I'll just turn it right about, I don't know, how would you solve that? And they're like, well, I've thought about it. Here's what I would do. I'm like, oh, you have a point of view. All right, I love that. Um, so that is the practical stuff, right? You got your five characteristics. You have your backwards and forwards looking behavioral and hypothetical examples. And you're gonna come in with great questions because you did the research that went just a little bit deeper than a cursory Google search. All right. And by the way, I can't see the chat, which is super uncool. Um, so if there are questions, I apologize. I haven't seen them. So if somebody wants to throw them my way, I'm, uh, if, the, if anything comes in the chat, just yell at me. Yeah, I'm monitoring um, them, Conrad, and there's nothing, oh, okay. nothing yet. Awesome, all right, thanks. And amazingly, I just made the chat appear. So here we are. I will say I've had to become technologically bilingual because this will shock you. Google doesn't use Zoom. So I'm flipping back and forth. Uh, all right. So practical stuff. Um, for those of you who came for just like the, the practical stuff, you're welcome to go get lunch. If you want the good stuff, though, stick around because here's, uh, here's where I think we really take it to rock star level. All right. Um, here's the first one know your value proposition. Uh, this is a very personal thing that you have to have a level of honesty, self-awareness, and get rid of any of your um, unnecessary modesty around. Know what you bring to the table that is unique and special and goes beyond like, hey, I'm really good at this set of things that can be done because guess what? A lot of people are good at things. Um, what is that thing that you bring that you're like, hey, this is if you hire me, you're getting something good. It kind of aligns to that magic, that sprinkle of magic in um, culture ad. Um, what do I bring that I don't think you're going to get from anybody else? And, and if you can communicate that in a way that is authentic and doesn't, it ain't bragging if it's true, but you can still sound like you're bragging. Um, I remember when I got uh, when I was interviewing at Google, this was, you know, fall of 2010 back. And it was back in a different time at Google when it was like brain teaser, brain teaser questions that were garbage. I did nine interviews in two and a half months. It's just, it was so unnecessary. So they were kind of exhausting you along the way. And I was in one of my final interviews with the eventual hiring manager. And she goes like, you know, she said something about, you know, tell me what is something that you would bring that we don't have. And I said, look, and I was, I was honestly kind of tired. I go, look, here's the deal. I, I'm not at Google, but I don't think you have anybody who's better than presenting at me. And I think that's demonstrably true because I MC events, I MC running races. I have to sit on the microphone at a marathon for seven hours talking nonstop and trying to be interesting to 26,000 people who are going by, some of whom are about to throw up. Like that, if I can hold that group, I know I can hold a client. Have I ever sold before? No. Have I, do I, am I a media? No. Do you have anybody who can do what I do? No. So that's what I'm bringing. If you can find somebody else who's already done the job and is average at it, huzzah, hire them. If you want to get somebody who's going to take what I can do and apply it to something I think I can learn, I'm your guy. And I just laid it out there. That's the value proposition. I would say the same thing today. True story. She then said, oh, I ran the New York marathon. Why don't you call me across the finish line? Pretend I'm running across the finish line. And there and then in that interview, I called Catherine Friedrich, who's now at Thrive Global with the uh, CMO of Thrive Global with uh, Ariana Huffington. Uh, I called her across the finish line in an interview and I said, that's it right there. And she's like, you weren't kidding, were you? I'm like, no, that is demonstrably true. I will, I could talk for seven hours. How We have 30 minutes. I'm not even warmed up. My throat isn't even, I could do this all day. I had her, I had her. What is your core value proposition? And the goal here, as I teased earlier, is differentiation. The goal here is differentiation because they're going to get a dozen 
or a hundred or God, 500 resumes. They're going to be, people are coming from all sides. And your job is to make sure you stand out in a way that is authentically you and demonstrably true. Because here's my theory on this. I'm sure somebody who is in the job of career development would probably say, this is terrible advice. Um, I think you should make yourself the easiest no, the easiest yes or the easiest no, but we love you. So we're going to find somewhere for you. But you don't want to be caught in that gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Thank you, Teddy Roosevelt. You don't want to be in the middle where you were just like the other 500 resumes or even in an interview, we had five people and I couldn't remember two, three, and four, but number one was my easiest S. I knew 10 minutes into the interview, she was incredible. And make yourself an easy no that is so impressive that they find a place for you. Because trust me, We've had multiple people where they've interviewed with us and we're like, oh my God, you're so good, but you are not right for this role. So can you just be patient? We're going to wait for a role to open up. I've had that happen more times than I can count. I've even had people who were in interviews with me who I told them on the spot, I'm not hiring you for this role. It's not good enough for you. You're freaking amazing. Can you pause? We're going to find a place for you. And if not in Google, I'm on your side and I'm going to find a place for you somewhere. That has happened multiple times be the easiest yes or the easiest no, but we love you, do not get stuck in the middle. And that comes down to knowing your value proposition, how you're gonna differentiate and telling that story authentically. And that's a, that's a you, that's on you. I mean, this is, this is not resume stuff. This is having a good hard conversation with yourself around what do I bring to the table? Why would somebody wanna like take a chance on me? Which kind of gets to this notion of, uh, I got this from a mentor early. Um, start with the end. He was like, you know, you keep thinking about what is the next thing and what is the next thing. Conrad, can we pause? Yeah. For question. Oh, Mind? absolutely. Okay. So Kathy um, Morris oh. says, so um, in those instances, so she's talking about the not when you're not for this role. Hmm. Uh, how do you keep in contact? Um, how do you totally. keep the thread going? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, no, Kathy, it's a great, it's a great question. In that, in those instances, um, I've made an invitation and said, "Hey, formally, we're going to keep you in our in, in our applicant system, which we are very diligent about. So on the formal side, we're just our HR team, our recruiters. We're going to keep you in that system, so you don't need to worry. When something opens up, we're going to be reaching out to you. So there's a very kind of transactional, practical application of that." But I'm also signaling to them, I'm like, I think you're super impressive. Let's just stay in touch. And in those cases, it was just like every quarter, you know, they would reach out, hey, this is posted, this is right for me. And I'm like, no, 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 stay patient. That one's not the right, but thanks for checking in. So they would come back to me with Google postings that they were trying to determine if those are right. And then they were also just doing the like relationship building thing. Um, in the instance of one of them, she just came back like, the next day, hey, thank you. Do you mind if I stay in touch? I'm like, not at all. We connected on LinkedIn, but I'm like, here's my email. You have it at Google. And then every quarter, so she would just check in. And eventually that slot opened up. It was a food and beverage team in Chicago. Got her in there for the interview. I was like, don't screw this up. Just hire this lady. She's so freaking good. And they hired her. She's in, and now I continue to mentor her at Google. It was just, now you're just into relationship building, Kathy. You can, you, I've given you permission to come in. Let's just stay close, add some value. You guys know how to build relationships. Value exchange, check in with me every quarter or so. Oh, you bet. So this notion of starting with the end, my mentor was like, hey, you, you, it, for you, it's like one move after the other, and you don't really seem to be playing this thing with any sort of path in mind. And his take was, because you don't have the end in mind, you don't really have a goal. He's like, I don't know what to tell you. If you don't know where you're going, any old road will, road will do, right? If you, if you jump in the car with me and I go, where do you want to go? And you're like, I don't care and we end up in San Francisco, don't get mad at me because we're not in San Diego. You did, you didn't care. And so I went north and you wanted to go south. You have to know at least an endpoint and be navigating to it. Now, here's the beauty. It doesn't matter if you get there. It really doesn't. 
but you have to have somewhere you're aiming for because once you start going i want to go to san francisco cool get in the car how do we go i don't know we could go pch we could go 99 or we could go right up the middle on the five the five's fast but boring pch is slow but beautiful which way do you want to go and i guarantee you you're going to go mm, let's go pch it's beautiful and along the way you're going to find a side road and you're going to end up somewhere you never expected to be and along the way you'll be like i don't even think i'm gonna go to san francisco i love where i'm at and that's how your career is going to be it's impractical, it's messy, there isn't a map, but you got to at least have something you're aiming for. It is really hard to steer a ship. I mean, you ever see those ships in um, Long Beach, they're like a thousand feet long. Those things take like a mile to steer in the open ocean, like a mile to just make a 90 degree turn. Do you know how impossible it is to steer that ship if it is lashed to port? You can't do it. You can't turn a ship that's lashed to port. Get in the ocean, aim for something. And if you, if you don't like where you're going, start to turn. It's going to take a while. But if you don't have an endpoint in mind and get out in the ocean, you're never going to get there. So you got the practical stuff. You got the impractical stuff. Um, now let's get to some important stuff. And this is where I'll sort of bring it, uh, bring it to a close. And then we'll get into some Q&A. Um, 2020, am I right? I'm sorry, there wasn't even a question there. Um, it was a, it was obviously a year and it was a, 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 a wonderfully horrible year because it allowed, I think all of us a, a sense to take a step back and, and ask some really big questions. So I asked those did, uh, did some work and here's, here's something I believe to be true. Um, I want you to really own this notion that a lot of how we think about career is from the neck up. It's from the ears in it's really thinky. And we think work is about like, okay, I have this professional and I'm thinking and, 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 and then I have these things that, you know, my heart and my passions and my purpose and all this stuff and never the twain shall meet. And I will offer that if you want to ensure that you have a very transactional relationship with your work and that if you want to ensure that your work is always just slightly dissatisfying, but you're never quite sure why, keep those two things separate and pretend that there's not a place where your head and your heart can meet in your work. or my invitation to you is work in that place where your head and your heart meet. It took me, what the year is it? <laughs> um, it's taken me basically to this point to get there. Part of it was not knowing I was supposed to, part of it was not believing I was supposed to, part of it was not knowing how to get those two things to meet. And then last year I got them there. Um, my offer to you is shorten that arc. Don't spend, you, you, whatever my professional career is super long. Um, trying to figure out that you don't know you're supposed to do this or you don't believe that it's true or that you don't know how to do it. Spend the time just getting there. Find that place where your head and your heart meet in the middle and work in that place. If you work in that place, all the other practical and even the impractical advice I gave you will make perfect sense and it won't sound hard. It'll sound like a joy. So nested in there is a little how. There's like a how, because this is freaking hard. Otherwise I would have done it when I was like 35. Um, here's my offer on how our world is so noisy. It's so noisy guys. There's email, there's social media, there's your phone and texts are always going off. There is friends and family. And now we have to do everything in this. And my world is a 13 inch screen in a room. The world is really noisy. Your head is where you spend all that noise time and your heart is where you want to be and you want to meet in the middle for work. But your heart whispers, the world yells. All of this yells and your heart whispers. And the beauty is that the whisper is super quiet, but it's always there. And what I found out was it was always whispering and I just couldn't hear it over the noise. And the noise can look super attractive. The noise can be a title, an office, stock options, discounted food, free food at Google. It can be all these perks and travel. It can be accolades and externalized awesomeness. And it's super, super noisy. But the beauty is the whisper is always in you and you know exactly what it is, but you can't hear it. If you can tune down the noise and hear the whisper, once you hear it, you can never unhear it. And then the ball's in your court because now it's whether you choose to listen to that whisper because you'll never not hear it again. And once you hear it, you'll learn how to tune down the noise 
and all the externalized stuff that you've been chasing will take a backseat to figuring out how do I make that whisper connect, that purpose connect the head and the heart and find work in that place. So practical, impractical, important. They actually run in inverse proportion to how easy they are. Practical stuff, you know, practical, it's rooted in practice. What do we talk about? Any Alan Iverson? Practice, we talk about practice. You could just practice all that stuff for an interview. The impractical stuff's a little harder because you have to sit with yourself think. The important stuff's hard because you can't think. You have to stop thinking. The noise is all thinky stuff. So um, I will give to you, if you can apply your effort in appropriate measure to each of those things, I think you will find uh, that you have a rock star pitch, that you get the job you want and the job starts being a job and starts being your purpose. And again, it'll be that place where your head and your heart meet. And I will leave you this quote from Albert Hubbard. He was an American writer back in the late 1800s or 1900s, also like a wildly interesting guy and an anarchist and a radical thinker. Uh, and he said, we work to become not to acquire. And I will leave you with the offer that this is a great time. Coming out of the back end of 2010, which is a dumpster fire, this is a chance to live into your personal greatness, find that purpose, connect your head and your heart, and do something great. And with that, I will pause. And we'll All go right. to questions. All right. Ab absolutely fabulous. Um, insight and information for us, Conrad, really, really appreciate it. We've got some great questions from our audience, uh, starting with Darby Barton. She wants to know what was your whisper? <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I, uh, Darby, thank you for the question. I saw it. I won't leave you hanging because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not sort of like hard to get or, or conceptual. It was very, when it came to me, when I got it after, you know, pretending it wasn't there for 48 years. Um, for me, the land where I landed Darby and it was a it was a crystal clear download. The only reason I, I am here for the rest of my time on this uh, planet is I am here to help un people unlock their highest potential. And if I screw around doing anything else, I'm not only wasting my time, I'm wasting a universe gifted piece of knowledge. Like it's just, it's what I know to be true, right? That is my purpose. So if I screw around doing anything else, I'm not only ripping up myself, I'm rip, ripping off everybody else who should be benefiting from that. It is to help people unlock their highest potential. So now it's pretty actually pretty easy because it disqualifies like 900,000 things I could be doing and it narrows that down to like three. So my career stuff's really simple. And Darby, I will say this, once I got that, it was in mid-June, I cannot make this stuff up. It was the first week of June, I got it. The next week I got offered my adjunct faculty position at Marshall. And the week after that, Google opened up a role to develop the sales coaching program, both of which aligned perfectly to that. Uh, to that. But it the universe was not going to give it to me until I heard the whisper and tuned out all the other noise. Sounds super woo woo. I'm just telling you what happened. I'm just, I'm just reporting facts. Cause I'm not like, I don't look, I did. I wasn't like looking at a crystal when this happened and like, yeah, this just, I got it. And once I got it, the universe was like, okay, now that you got it, here it is. Go. It does sound woo woo. I grant you it sounds woo woo. So I'm not going <laughs> to pretend it doesn't. <laughs> but it's, I'm just telling you that's how it happened in June. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Conrad, we have another question from the audience. Yeah. Is there a way that we can schedule rehearsals for interviews? I feel the lack of criticism is more troubling. I walk away from interviewees, interviews thinking I nailed it and yet never hear back from some of these companies. Would love the opportunity to just do a dry run and get instant feedback. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's so, it's so funny, Andrew. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by how little people practice. I mean, look, there's the big important stuff and the impractical stuff. You know what? The practical stuff is actually kind of easy because you can practice it. And I'm always shocked by how little people just get in, in practice. Karen Weiss is on this call and I have been together since day one when I walked into Pepperdine in 2001. And I'm like, so hold on. There's like a group of you who are just here to help me like prepare for interviews. Are you kidding me? Like, why isn't there a line out of your door? She's like, eh. and I'm just shocked that people don't take advantage of Pepperdine's resourcing because there's a ton of resourcing that allows you to get in. I mean, 
they were like mock interviews, on the spot feedback, you know, rep 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 mm, repetitive feedback, just get in, do some, get some feedback, do it again. I think we even videotaped the interviews so you could see how like you looked and sounded on camera. Spoiler alert, terrible, um, <laughs> but you get better if you actually do it. And so I would say, actually, Andrew, this is one that's a kind of a layup. Pepperdine's got you on this one, unless you got, unless Nicole uh, and, and Robin and Karen want to tell me that they that you don't do that, which I'd be shocked. Uh, Bridget, help me out. Like this is something oh, you guys I mean, don't offer. I mean, this is it's Karen. Hi, everybody. I think we have do we have more alumni on the on this than, than students or a mix? So obviously, if you're an enrolled student, yes, you know, if you're not knocking on our door while you're a student, then shame on you. But even for alumni, I mean, there's so many different resources, including reaching out to one of us in the Career Center. But, you know, there's there's interview stream, which is a it's, it's an um, software application where you can practice, you can see yourself recorded, you can send it, send the interview to people and they can give you feedback. So I think it's just what you're saying, Conrad, which is people just don't do it enough. You know, it's just like, I mean, you're a triathlete, right? So you can't, you wouldn't enter a race without, you know, training, right? And running and swimming and getting on your bike. And, you know, you just have to practice. To, to be clear, I have done that, but I can tell you what the results were. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't terribly Not good. good. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, if you want to have the equivalent of like an achy knee and getting dead last, don't practice for your interview. Um, so yes, for even for alumni, I would say, gosh, I would think, the place I'd go is I would connect with other alumni who are also on the job search and just form like, I mean, form like a, a, a clutch of people who are willing to do that work with each other. I bet you could find people who'd be willing to donate an hour a month to just get on a video call and just run the material. Man, that seems like a pretty good idea. Uh, I actually like that idea. I just thought it on the fly. And I think even through Pep Connect, right? Right, Robin and Nicole, through Pep Connect, you can connect with an, a Pepperdine alum and set up something like that. Yes, and we actually have for this event, um, we do have a networking form that was gonna be introduced in a little bit, but we, it's great mentioning it now where you can stay connected with one another. So you can share your information. It will be sent out after, but Pep Connect, LinkedIn, you know, are great avenues for you all to stay connected, especially for this that. series and kind of work with one another. Mm -hmm. I love that. I didn't know that, but wow, what a, there you go, set spike. Well yeah. done. <laughs> and I, I have I have one more comment too, and I think that's you know Andrew had a great question because I think if you get this practical stuff really wrote really down, then you can start thinking about the other you know the other kind of uh, you know the other types of of ways to connect with you know with your with either your interview the person you're interviewing with or whoever you're talking to. So. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite things, I do a lot of pitches, um, whether it's interviews or whatever, I practice in front of the mirror, I practice in my car, I practice in front of my dog. I mean, you know, I, I practice, 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 practice till it's totally rote. And, and especially your value proposition, you just want it to be, you know, right off your tongue and, and sound authentic. So, great. Linda, should we keep going? There's some great questions. Yeah, there's some really great questions. So um, uh, Kevin actually has a uh, comment. Kevin uh, Schaller from a spiritual perspective, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren is an insightful um, in touching on your purpose. Yeah, that's a good good mm -hmm. comment. Um, Le, uh, Leilani Busello asks, how do you deal with competition? Leilani, can you, if you care to come off chat or feel comfortable doing so, can you unpack that a little bit more for me? How do, how did you deal with competition? I want to make sure I'm thinking about this. In the Basically, right way. like, has it ever happened that you felt uh, intimidated and, um, you know, um, in terms of like, oh, you see all this competition, especially when you're like applying for a job and um, especially because I asked that because like for me, uh, I would be intimidated because I don't have, what if like, I like that company and I know I can be like a, a great um, input mm. for that company, but I don't have ex enough experience because I've been a student my whole life, pretty yeah. much. I always had like a traditional path, um, you know, being a student, I have my part-time job, you know, but mm -hmm. do you think that uh, just skills you know, building your skills is more important than getting actual work experience. 
Um, oh, you got a few things I want to unpack there. All right. Um, Karen, have I ever been intimidated? <laughs> um, oh, no. Not, not um, here's the thing, uh, Lelani, I will start with this. I don't feel like I'm in competition with other people, even if there are a lot of people who are applying for a specific role. Um, my job is to go out there and tell the best story about me that I can, that I think hits those points, that I'm a great problem solver, that I'm going to be an amazing teammate, that I'm a beast on work ethic, that you know these things are all true. And I feel like if I do a good job of telling that, then it's up to them to say like, and that's, you know, I told that story, I straight up said, if you need somebody who has done the job before and is demonstrably going to be able to do an average job, please hire that person. If you want somebody who's going to bring something you don't have, hire me. And I just like, there it is. Easiest yes or easiest no. Mm -hmm. So I think you can get, you know, what I would say is it sounds like as I listen to you, there's sort mm -hmm. of a kind of a, an orientation towards I'm competing with all these other people. And that makes me feel like I can't tell my story the way I want. Tell your story the way you want and be super honest with that and have it come from the heart. That'll show. And look, at the end of the day, if they just want a worker bee who can do the job that's there, there's nothing you can do about that. But that's not on you. That's on them. All right. So now your other question was, I went mm -hmm. down this path, student, part-time job. I have it. You know, it's the catch-22. They want experience, but I can't get experience. Eh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Like, I just could take that off the table, sidestep that. Um, because if you feel like you have a great story to tell, you just simply need to find people to tell it to. So if you're always coming in the front door with 100 or 200 or 500 resumes, yeah, it's going to be a lot of competition. If you don't feel like you're playing a game you can win, stop playing the game. Every single job I have got, from the first job out of Pepperdine to the, the job at Disney to the job at Activision to the job at, at Google, and now my job within Google came not because I applied first, I had to apply eventually, but because of a connection. Came through a Pepperdine mm -hmm. connection, a Pepperdine connection, a Pepperdine connection, and then a work connection, and then just being an internal networker in order. Every single job came because somebody knew that I'd be a great candidate before I even applied so that it didn't get me the job, but it got me around the gatekeeping of 200 and 500 resumes where all they're doing is scanning for keywords and experience. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that stuff is least common denominator hiring. And it's resulting in a lot of average hiring. I think like if you're just scanning resumes or keywords, you're, you're distilling people's magic down to the lowest common denominator. And Leilani, I don't think that's where you want to play. So you're going to use mm -hmm. your time, both either as a student and certainly after, to meet people. Meet people in the companies you want to work for, the industries you want to work for, doing the roles you want to do, or just people who are interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then that's some what I've been doing. Like, Leilani's got it. Like, there's this job. Oh, God, I have to introduce her to somebody. That has been every job I've gotten. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing, like through LinkedIn, like, you know, all every day, every day. Yeah. Don't give up. Find somebody who's going to hear the story. And by the way, here's the beauty, Leilani. You don't need 50 people to hire you. You don't need 20. You don't need five. You need one person who believes in you, hears the story and goes that we don't have that. And you know what? The other 49 can get bent because they're doing the keyword scans and they're hiring the least yes. common denominator and they're not getting you. So don't worry about it because if you allow yourself to anchor to the 200 resumes and the competition and the 49 companies didn't get me, you know what? They're lost. They're lost. You have just, I'm a con I'm, please stay confident, tell your story and find people who are going to hear it. Cause all it takes is the one person to be like, yeah, mm -hmm, I'm in. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. Yeah, you're right. welcome. Fantastic. Um, I just want to uh, bring to the attention of, of everybody, please read the comments. I'm going to pick out the questions, but there's a lot of really great information in here, some resources um, that you can use. So uh, the next question is from Rory LaSalle. He said, uh, leadership is a team that gets, uh, is a term, sorry, that gets th thrown around by many professionals. Um, are there specific competencies that you feel stick more during interviews than others? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> I'm a leader. Um, it's interesting. I, I think, Rory, the place that um, I think you can really bring that to life, and I, I hopefully I, heard, I, I made that little distinction when I, when I was talking about those characteristics. Leadership can be a title and the number of people you manage, and right, that, there's that piece. 
I think where you can bring that to life is places where you weren't expected to be a leader or where there was a kind of a ship adrift and a group that wasn't quite getting it. There might've been conflict or maybe a lack of consensus or no clear vision. And you were able to come in and demonstrate through your proactivity. Again, I called it emergent leadership. I don't think we use that term as much anymore, but we used to use that a lot at Google is this notion of don't have a title, but you jumped into a place that needed leadership and you drove something through to conclusion. So if you can have those examples and you can either have those, like I said, the uh, behavioral examples that are, you know, from your past or hypotheticals, what you would do and be able to clearly articulate what you would do in a situation. I think those are the things where you can land those competencies of leadership in a way that are, are, are really resonant. Like, hey, I was on a team. There was a ton of conflict. Rather than going right in and trying to say, hey, you have to get along, I dug in. I realized that there was this and there was that and I got to this and I got to the root cause. And then we, you know, and you can talk about how that, because of that conflict, we weren't able to move this agenda forward. We had to move it forward. We were under a time crunch. My manager wasn't addressing this. I took those people aside. Like if you could tell that story and you know what? I was just their peer. The notion that you influence the outcome of a team as a peer rather than a titled leader is so deeply powerful and to me resonant and brings that leadership story to life more than, hey, I was a director with 49 reports and we drove tons of re revenue. Great, are you a strategist? Do you know how to manage people? Even more, do you know how to develop people? Did you bring something out of those people? Are they better now than when you got there? Those kind of things are leadership. You guys got me super pumped up. The, um, that last one I really love, are the people around you better because they interface with you? Are they better? Are you developing them? Peers, man, if you're lifting your peers, that to me is leadership without title in a way that is so powerful for an organization because it means I'm not just hiring you. I'm hiring you and you're lifting everybody. You are gonna be a tide that lifts all boats. Tell that story, man, that's a good story. All right. Seriously, I'm like super energized. The rest of everybody who's gonna get me from one o'clock on is gonna be like, what? Is, what, what did, did he do? do? Did he have what did caffeine? What did you do at lunch? What did you do at lunch? <laughs> I just talked to Pepperdine alum and students. I, oh, that's great. I'm ready to go get a new job, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a, um, a question from Gray. I think it's a Gray Aweary that's a comment to what you were talking to Leilani about uh, regarding networking. So would you use a different approach than what you were talking about in terms of networking mm -hmm. um, if you by working with a search firm or executive recruiter? You know, Gray, I, I feel unqualified to take that question. I've never worked with a recruiter or a search firm. And I don't want to give bad advice and, and step outside my lane. So at the risk of like punting on that question, I'm going to punt on that question. Cause I just don't want to give, uh, I don't want to give advice that comes from a place without direct knowledge. And I think that's maybe one of my strong points is I know exactly where my lane is and I feel like this is out of it. So I apologize. But if somebody else wants to jump in, I just don't feel like I, I would be giving a informed answer. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm sorry. fair enough. Yeah. All right. Um, Jamie Parrott, uh, do you have any advice for someone who is considering mm. shifting careers and perhaps looking for opportunities in an entirely different industry? Yeah, I do. Um, this, one's, this one's so exciting to me because that notion of, you know, sometimes you have the, the soft pivot five or 10 degrees to the left or right of what you're doing. And sometimes you have the, the, the hard turn 90 left or right. And it sounds like that's what you're talking about. Um, such an exciting time because you're like, you are wiping the slate clean and saying, this is my new, my new direction. Um, I have some personal experience here because I happen to be married to a woman who left a 18 year career in corporate uh, talent acquisition and is now a social worker. So whatever, whatever the opposite of talent acquisition for a big nasty video game a company looks like, it looks like social work. Um, so she made that pivot. So I feel like I'm coming from a, a really honest and informed place here. Um, the first thing I would say is go back to my hard stuff, uh, the big picture things, the important things. Um, understand why you're making that pivot. My gut says if you are making that pivot, Jamie, it's because you're ready to leave something that isn't serving you and going into something that inspires you. That would be my gut. I doubt it would be the other direction. 
<laughs> I'm super inspired. I just kind of just want to work on spreadsheets. Like, I don't think I've ever heard anybody really say that. So my gut is, you know, there's something that's calling you. So I would say, take a beat, the first thing and figure out why is it calling you? What's calling you? What is the whisper? It sounds like you're hearing it. So start there. Now work back up the other direction. Okay, cool. Value proposition, differentiation. What am I bringing from that old thing? that is transferable, and we all probably heard the term transferable skills, that I can tell this really cool story that says, yeah, I was doing this. I'm leaving that for these reasons, and I'm bringing from that these things. And again, I will just speak to my wife's experience. I'm leaving this thing because of these reasons, probably not hard to divine what those reasons are, um, around making a difference and around having an impact and changing people's lives. And I'm bringing with me this set of transferable skills. I can assure you the number of people in social work with 20 years of corporate management experience, not a lot. So she was bringing this whole really interesting set of skills. And then she went back and got her master's, um, you know, to validate to be a social worker. Um, so there was a notion of training, which may or may not be part of your experience. But I do think that notion of work from the bottom up. What's the whisper? What's the purpose? What's the why? Now, how do I take those transferable skills and make those relevant and tell this really great differentiated story? And then park it with the practical stuff and crush the interview. Um, this is an exciting time, Jamie. And I, again, I just have to infer from the question that you're going towards something that is more, more of a call to you. I mean, you're, I can, if you care to share, it'd be really interesting to hear. Sure, absolutely. No, I, uh, my background is marine biology. I was a zookeeper and worked in animals for many years. And I decided that I wanted to take on a role in management in sort of the nonprofit animal space. And of course, I did my MBA and I'm in healthcare and I've been here running a company for 10 years. I deal in contracts for doctors and I would love to get back to something that calls me something environmental, working for a zoo, uh, something I'm passionate about. And I, I have my hand in nonprofits, but from yeah. a volunteer perspective, I'd like to move into actually making that my career. Sure. If I had a dollar for every, I was a zookeeper and became a uh, you know, medical contracts worker, I'd be rich. I mean, boy, that is the story of all this time, isn't it, gang? Um, wow. Okay. I'm literally floored by this. <laughs> I need a minute. That's amazing. So Jamie, clearly we know where your heart is at and now you've run this arc and you, I got to believe you bring a whole, a wealth of skills from 10 years in healthcare and contracts that any nonprofit would thirst to have. And you, 10 years back, you have a, a great deal of credibility, match that credibility with the arc you've been on, pair that together in a new narrative that excites somebody. Someone's going to hear that. Someone's going to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Now I appreciate all your advice. This is, this is awesome. And I saw that somebody else had the same question. Uh, so I'm sure that was super Wait, helpful. For them not another zookeeper question. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I can't speak to that. So. Okay. <laughs> Pivoting to a, to a different career. Um, here's a, 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 another question from Darby Barton. Any tips for communicating or narrowing your value prop when you enjoy and are, and are seen as a jack of all trades? person slash manager right. yeah Darby, that's a that's a good one i mean jack of all trades can be interesting in a general kind of a general management position or in an early stage company where they need somebody who is willing to and able to dive in on a bunch of stuff so part of it might be if you're into earlier stage companies that becomes a strength some companies where they are more verticalized or they're more you know cross function like they have functions and it's it's a little more defined certainly it at my company, they're looking for people with kind of a narrow set of role-related knowledge. I, I think it's adjacent to the, what we just said with Jamie, where it's, what are the transferable skills that in that jack of all trades, I'm good at, I'm pretty good on a balance sheet and I'm pretty good with an income statement. Like I can manage a PL, right on, cool. I'm also pretty good with creative. Um, I mean, gosh, we're starting to paint a picture of like, I, I know how to do some research and stats work. Like you could imagine, oh, well, it sounds like you're a brand manager. Like, so you could package that up into, hey, there's roles where all of those come together to be very powerful and brand manager, that's literally it. Or you can take the one and say, this is where I'm the one thing. Like, you know, for me, it was sales. Like I was a brand manager. There's a bunch of stuff you have to do that I wasn't that interested in. You know what I really love is the media and advertising part of it. And so I went into sales, ad sales. You might just say, okay, 
the story I'm going to tell is this is the thing I'm focused on. And all those other things have transferable skills that come into that to elevate me above anybody else doing that specific thing. And effectively, I would say that's what the story I told is though I have never sold ads and I've never been directly in media, that was a component, jack of all trades, brand manager. That was a component of what I did. It's what I truly loved. And I can demonstrably show that I learned all these other things that'll inform this narrower focus that would be more challenging for somebody who didn't have all my other expertises and interests. And I would say the last thing is, it's what makes you interesting. Part of your value proposition is, you know, I'm good at a bunch of stuff and it doesn't matter what you need me to do. I'm going to flex to be able to do that extremely well. That's a good story. In fact, some companies won't like that. And some companies will be like, yeah, we need somebody. I'm hiring you not for this job. I'm hiring you to maybe work for two jobs for us. I can see you having a career here. Find those companies. Because again, a company just wants you to be a narrow worker bee. God bless them, but that might not be you. And you have to be willing to walk away from that. Is that helpful? So I got two thumbs up for Dari. Yeah. All right, um, Conrad and everybody else, oh we're going to have to wrap this up. This has are been we so we are at time. Um, I think we're over time. Nicole's, Nicole's looking at me. Um, this has been so fantastic. Uh, really, really great insight. Fabulous questions from the audience. Um, I am going to mute my mic and turn it over to Nicole because I think she has some, some closing uh, um elements to take care of. So thank you, Conrad. And um, thank you, Nicole. And thanks for everybody for being such a great audience. Thank, thank you, you both so much. Yes, this was such an awesome presentation. We um, will continue to share out the um, resources and, you know, connect on the networking form. It's a really imperative that you do that to stay connected with everyone that's here on the session. Those slides and details I will share out in the post event um, email. Okay. And then last but not least, let me turn it over to our senior director of the alumni engagement team, Robin Doty, to give some closing remarks. Thank you all. Well, thank you again uh, to Conrad and Linda for presenting today and for your valuable insights. I know I took a little uh, faucets to add to my diamond and to make it shine. Uh, so truly, uh, really learned a lot, very inspirational. And thank you everyone today for joining our session. It's recorded and we will send it out in case you missed anything. Um, feel free to share that as well once we send it out. We hope you'll always consider the Grazio School as your lifelong learning provider and resource to assist you with career support, forums to network and ways to form forge meaningful connections, please remember to keep us posted about your career journey and your success along the way, as well as consider sharing your knowledge and experiences um, with um, serving in a volunteer capacity. Be sure to stay connected. We talked a lot today about using and leveraging the network. We have many social media platforms. We have Pep Connect. Uh, to network with fellow alumni. They can really be an asset to you. In closing, I'd also like to share one special event that might interest you. We have coming up on March 30th at noon. Um, it's to commemorate the Center for Women and Leadership board member and alumna, Stacy Gordon's newest publication, Unbias, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work. Stacy's uh, course that she has on unconscious bias has been taken over a million times. So it's something you might wanna look into. And she'll be joined by Kim Blue Terrell, the VP of People Experience at Zoom. Uh, until then, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Um, and also be safe, be well, and listen for your whisper. 